I want to try out a, a story on you today, uh, an argument <coughs> relevant to the, the, the uh, task at hand here. There's a friend of mine who is a, now is a very successful business, but he used to work for AT&T, and for 20 years he was a programmer and a coder and all the rest. And he says for 20 years he kept looking for the, uh, the inner room, the, the place where the seven guys that ten guys that ran the company were, and he was trying to get in that inner room. And finally he realized after 20 years that there really isn't an inner room. It's the whole operation of the company that produces whatever it is that is produced. And that sort of general mystery is a, a long and familiar one. Uh, Leibniz described it as the, uh, with his analogy of the mill. He says, you know, if you walk in a mill and you can get inside and blow it up so and walk against all the parts and lean against them, there's no one part that would help you understand how the mill produces its function. And this uh, is a general problem. We all face it uh, all the time. And uh, the question is, uh, what is that, how is that going to impact, that reality is going to impact on neuroscience and those of us interested in, in particularly the mind-brain issue. And I would... I would like to suggest that uh, traditional neuroscience uh, thinks in a very linear, sequential way that A produces B, produces C, and bingo, you've got us. And I think uh, what we're coming to understand is that uh, it's really a, we're a layered dynamical system and that uh, our brain actually produces the mental states that we enjoy, but that, those mental states come back and, and constrain the very, the very brain that uh, produced it. And uh, with that view, we also now have learned over the last 50 years, 60 years of intense work that there's the brain is highly modularized, it's specialized, there's all kinds of evidence for this uh, throughout uh, neuroscience. And uh, moreover, that uh, the brain is on all the time doing this, uh, this work and so we have all these modules uh, interacting. And in fact, it can be described that, that uh, the modules in our brain are not only there, and we and neuroscience task is to identify them both functionally and structurally, but also we're, we're part of a modular system of the whole world. There are things out in the world which we are now incorporating into our mental and cognitive life. Philosopher Andy Clark has made a big deal about this, but we all feel it with our PDAs and our other devices that are external to us. We think that some of our internal modules may be kind of becoming lackluster because of the, of the issue of the modules on the outside. In other words, as an evolved structure, we'll grab anything to seem to make our evolutionary <coughs> process uh, uh, be maximized. And in a wonderful uh, study that comes out of Hod Lipson's group at Cornell, They've taken and analyzed the actual uh, ability to make individual finger movements and studying a cadaver hand, they realized that in fact the um, amount of information that's in the actual somatic system and the, t and the uh, muscle uh, tendon uh, interactions, that the, there's so much information there that the actual message that the nervous system sends out to allow for this fine individual uh, movement we enjoy is quite crude and quite quite simple. And this is all by way of painting the picture that we're highly modularized. Uh, what, what is it? How do these modules interact? How are we going to come to understand that? And uh, so, so with that view, I want to offer a couple of, of insights that come out of uh, my, my own work from, um, from studying these patients who have had their hemisphere uh, divided. And it's the general the phenomenon that every clinician knows and uh, most psychologists know of self-cueing, that what we do all day long is cue ourselves in, in indirect and sometimes direct ways to function. And you can see this uh, in, the, in the clinical setting where patients are constantly trying to show you that they don't have a deficit that you're trying to study, or when you're actually testing them and asking question A, they're actually answering question B. I'll never forget the time I was at Cornell and, and Fred Plum, a distinguished neurologist, uh, was interviewing a patient in bed A, and just as he would ask a question, every time he, then he turned to the residents to make a didactic res, uh, response, and the patient would, in bed B would answer. 
And uh, he pointed out that it was very important to get the answer from the patient that you asked the question <laughs> to. But anyway, so, uh, so I thought I'd give you uh, two or three uh, concrete examples of how, how this works and sort of set the stage for the need to understand how these modules may be interacting and how, in fact, that may not be a, in a sense, a neuroscientific question. It's going to be other levels of analysis that's going to capture that. So what I'm going to show you is a simple uh, little bedside, one, one and a half minute video here of a patient that I'm giving commands to. Now I'm not going to set up what the patient is or what the story is. And it, it may just look like random nonsense, but then I'm going to show you what is going on, and I'll show you the uh, the uh, the uh, tape again. So here we go. With your left hand, make a fist. With your right hand, make a hitchhiker's gesture. Good. With your left hand, make a hitchhiking gesture. Good. <laughs> with your right hand, make a uh, no. With your left hand. Make the motion of uh, like using a screwdriver. With which hand? A screwdriver with the left hand. With the left hand. Um. <laughs> All right, try it with your right hand. Okay, now with your left hand. Okay. So now, like okay, with your right hand, make a the A O K sign. How about with your left hand? Okay. Now let's close your eyes. Your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. Now with your right hand, make me a hitchhiker sign. With your left hand, make me the A O K sign. Eyes closed. Just, eyes are closed. <laughs> Okay, now with your right hand, make a screwdriver. With your left hand, make a screwdriver motion. Screwdriver first. Okay, that's. So, those of you who are neuropsychologists and experience these matters know what the story is. This is a patient who's had her hemisphere separated, a so called split brain patient. This is cutting the callosum, so uh, in an effort to control epilepsy, so information one half of the brain doesn't go to the other is the consequence, but the idea for the treatment in the surgery, of course, was to prevent an interhemispheric uh, spread of seizure activity. And what this does is produce the famous uh, split brain syndrome, where uh, after the surgery, patients can uh, name anything to the right of fixation uh, because it goes to their left dominant speech hemisphere, so they can say the word ring but they deny the presence of the word key, yet with the left hand, uh, they can go find the key because the tactile information from the left hand goes to the right brain, the right brain saw the word key, and it solves the problem. So that's the classic uh, disconnection effect. So you have a left dominant speech center and a right hemisphere uh, that is non-dominant and doesn't talk. And Map on top of that how the motor system is basically uh, distributed in, in, in us, which is that the left hemisphere has very good control of the right arm and hand and only mild control of the left hand. So now the stage is set. Now you look at this patient and you begin to see the cueing mechanisms as to how they cover this. So first of all, I'm asking her to just do something. Your left hand make a fist. With your right hand, make a hitchhiker's gesture. That's easy. Good. With your left hand, make a hitchhiking gesture. Good. <laughs> so she sees the right hand model, and the left hand is simply copying the visual image. She's not, the, the left hemisphere actually isn't giving the command to control the hand. It's a simple copying gesture. With your right hand, make a uh, no, with your left hand, make the motion of uh, like using a screwdriver. With which hand? A screwdriver. With the left hand? With the left hand. Um. Uh, eyes are open, but the left hemisphere can't control the left hand, and the right hand hasn't given a model to just copy in this other feedback loop.
right, try it with your right hand. Okay, now with your left hand. Right hand stops, so I can't okay. copy. Okay. Now, okay, with your right hand, make a the A OK sign. How about with your left hand? Yeah, and a copy, no problem doing it. Now you 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 try the left hand directly. Okay. Now let's close your eyes. Your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. Now with your right hand, make me a hitchhiker sign. With your left hand, make me the A OK sign. Eyes closed. Eyes are closed. So, you see the trick. The patient, in order to make the body look like it's integrated across the, the split brain uh, condition, can cheat. And the local mechanism is that if there's a model for the left non speaking hemisphere to see the task, they can easily do a match to, to the model. But the direct flow from the left brain doesn't work. Here's a more integrated. Uh, example. This is case JW, and uh, we're flashing words to his right hemisphere and ask him what he sees, and uh, then he, uh, and he says he doesn't say anything, and then his left hand draws out the answer, and then you can see in the subsequent uh, interview, he actually tells us this, uh, it gives you an insight into this cueing mechanism, which he uses all the time given his uh, split brain status. Look right at that. See anything? And the flash. Can't flash. see the word. Okay. Look right at the dot. All right, I want you to draw for me uh, that thing upside down. I don't even know, but the description you just gave on something that I don't even know what I saw, it's kind of a hard thing to do. What do you guess that thing? See, if it's supposed to be upside down, looking more like a battle, I don't know what it is. What does it look like? I can't tell what it is. Car? No, that can't be a car. There ain't no wheels on it. Well, that's a good one. This was the word Texas later on in the testing session flashed again. I'm aware of a word, I didn't see what it was. So what? I'm, I'm aware of a word, I just didn't see what it was. Didn't see what it was? Okay. Uh, draw something that uh, goes with that. The symbol of that. What's that? Mm -hmm. Cowboy hat. Cowboy hat? What was the word? Texas. Yeah, that's right. Did you see Texas? No. But it struck me that, it, it, see, I don't see the word for it. Then I start drawing something and starts bringing what the word was. It's almost like the left hand's telling me what the word was when I'm starting to draw it. And then It's almost like I got this left side telling me what the word is after I get put it in motion, which sounds stupid. Yeah. Because I don't think I see it, and I start going 
with here, and then it, something clicks and it says what it was. Okay, let's try this one. Turn, turn the page. Something we do all the time. And then the final one, and this is the, the one really to, to force the issue. In this test, we're flashing the, the 1928 phrase to the right disconnected non-speaking hemisphere. I'm sorry, what are you flashing? The word, uh, the fr the, excuse me, the phrase 1928. And to the left hemisphere, the dominant speech hemisphere, we're flashing the word car. And so the instructions simply are draw what you see. Now the left hemisphere doesn't know anything about 1928 and knows something about car. He can tell you that it saw a car. And yet with his left hand, as you will see here, he draws an old time car. Now how is he doing that is the question. It's got to be this modular interaction actually here occurring as a result of the feedback that's on the piece of paper, not inside the head. And this is a, I apologize for this. At the end, the reason to sit through this is you see the old car at the end of it, just to make sure that we get that. I've got to edit this. So here we have again, just to say it again, car in the left hemisphere, 1928 in the right hemisphere, nothing going on inside the head, and yet somehow these two modules are interacting in some kind of strategy to produce well, the desired effect. And then finally, uh, this is another case VP where we are flashing compound words to her. And this is a patient that's gone on after her surgery to develop speech out of each hemisphere. So you have to be careful when you're testing her because you got to figure out which hemisphere is talking back to you. So the idea here was to give a word to one hemisphere and a word to the other and to do words of a particular kind to see if they would blend in any way. So uh, one, one of the words we test here is uh, we put the word breakfast up, which, where we put break to one hemisphere and fast to the other. So we split the word into two basically by virtue of the pic fixation point. And then the question is who talks to us? Does she say fast, break, or break, and fast, or does she somehow get breakfast out of the deal? And what you'll see is the first way she said, first thing she says, that she, her right hemisphere says br br like break, because that's what it sees. At that moment, the left hemisphere hears that br and stops it because it's seeing fast and it knows it's not break fast, it's breakfast. And then she goes back to correct herself for breakfast and then winds up just saying break and fast. So it's this quick cueing of separated systems and yet producing uh, what looks like a unified behavior. Just go ahead and say that first. Okay. Does that make sense? Is, yeah, is still supposed to make a word? No. It doesn't necessarily doesn't make a word? necessarily. So okay. like for example with honeymoon, if you saw moon okay. first, just go ahead and say moon honey. Okay. Doesn't I am okay. I never, that hasn't happened yet. Okay. If, if it does, I surely will. Okay. Mm hmm Break, break, break and fast. Okay. Okay. So the overall view is we've got all kinds of systems we know about where there are all these modules interacting. There's no person up there in charge uh, as we think, uh, we tend to think of how things work. And it turns out the greatest neurophysiologist probably that ever lived, Sir Charles Charing, nailed this uh, too many years ago to think about, but he basically kind of spells out how come there's not uh, these differences between patients who might have no, uh, the absence of a corpus callosum. This was prior to all the split brain work, of course. And he raises the question that the slightness of disability following destruction or developmental failure of the great commissure between the two halves of the brain 
And it could be just due to simple contemporarity. Just through time, the modules are acting. And that way that works is going to explain the uh, apparent unity of behavior that you see. So we're all intent on finding more about the patterns, the connections, uh, the genetic enabling systems for those connections and those systems. It's all very important work. But the issue I'd like to raise is that uh, maybe when that data is all collected, the task of seeing how the architecture works together in a complex layered way is really a task for all kinds of people and then not necessarily neuroscientists, that there may be a whole host of scientists trained in dealing with such abstract problems that might come in to help. So I would say that any major uh, brain effort should, in addition to the basic work that has to be done, there's just no question about that, there should be a few theorists around to keep thinking straight about potential, uh, potential ways of thinking how this assembly of items uh, uh, function and work. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks.